The Graphic Histories Podcast. I got bit by a radioactive bug. I tried experimental drugs. Went up for a stroll on a gamma testing range. I found an enchanted urucane. I made a serum that made me small. I modified the serum so it would make I me call. I got radioactive isotope in my Hey there, and welcome to the Graphic Histories Podcast. My name is Andre Mayette, your podcast host. Big thanks to Uka the Mock for our theme song, Superpowers. And big thanks to you for tuning in. Today, we talk with Joe Esma, who is a uh, Texas born and raised comic book artist who uh, is co-creator of Morning Glories with Nick Spencer and uh, does work in independent comics and mainstream books as well. Super cool guy and a great conversation, and uh, we have a lot in common, as I find, as I often find a lot of the folks that I talk to in these shows, and I do. I think it's because we all kind of come from the same place, especially people around our age bracket where you grew up in sort of a, a desert of, of nerdy culture, certainly not access to it. If you had a friend or a relative that was into it, that's about the extent of where you would find someone to talk about these sort of things, you know, read Wizard Magazine, hang out at the local hobby store, and uh, that's where you got to get your nerd on. Uh, before the internet came along and, and the community sprung up all over the place. We do talk about, at length, a little bit about some of the fun stuff, the pre-Facebook you know Facebook days where you know message boards are where you would congregate online to talk about your comic stuff. And made me nostalgic for a bygone era of the, uh, the Whitechapel boards with Warren Ellis and Bendis' board that he used to have before he kind of blew up and became a, a big mainstream creator. Really fun time and a great way to meet and uh, rub elbows with some of the people that created the comics you loved. A lot of the cool indie comic creators were hanging out on those boards, and you could have conversations with them and chat with them about their work. And it was uh, pretty cool, especially for that time period when uh, things were really different. Um, uh, so I am recording this episode pretty far in advance. I have quite a few guests in the hopper, and I'm flying through them, uh, basically recording these weekly uh, and then trickling them out bi-weekly. And uh, if it continues at the rate it's going, I may change the show to a weekly show, but I'm not quite ready for that yet. Um, big things going on in my personal life. I've uh, quit my office job, which I had uh, you know, been, been a, a, a long time coming. I do enjoy working there. I, I did like the people and the environment. However, you know, my own business is getting quite busy and, and I'd rather focus on that and make my own hours and all that beautiful stuff that comes with being self-employed. Also give me more time to work on comics and, uh, and some writing and things that I want to do as well, which I'm excited to do. I feel like it's been far too long and I really want to, you know, make something, create something that is mine and get it out there. So what that looks like and what that'll be, only time will tell, but I have some ideas and some cool things in the fire as well. Um, if you aren't already, please like and subscribe to uh, the show on whatever platform you're, you're checking it out on, and uh, spread the word. I mean, it also helps to, uh, to get that out there. As I mentioned, I'm recording this early, so this episode, I think, based on what I'm seeing here, will be dropping on the 11th of December, meaning Christmas is just around the corner, um, and... Hopefully you are a festive type. I know I am. I've talked about it in the show before that I do love the holidays and uh, the, the Christmas environment, the, the lights, the colors, the snow, and all that good stuff. So I'm very excited to see uh, you know what that season looks like this year and spend time with family, friends, and and as I am self-employed, I have more time to kind of you know make work when I can and uh, and play when I can, and hopefully the play gets to to, to be a more frequent thing, which I would love to see and do. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, big things. I'm excited. It's, it's a little uh, a little scary, but uh, I've been here before, and I think with my work the way it's going and the, the clients I have, I'm going to be uh, going to be busy and and happy, so, which is good. So, very much so. Uh, new chapter, as it were. Uh, yeah, but speaking of chapters and books and all that uh, iconography, let's talk about Joe Esma, who is uh, my guest for this episode. Uh, thanks again to Davin, my uh, Chateau producer, for uh, setting this up. Uh, Joe came to prominence with his work on Morning Glories with Nick Spencer. Really cool, different book that, uh, that made a lot of waves when it first came out and uh, hopefully will someday get the end it deserves. 
but in the meantime is on hiatus while Nick Spencer's off doing his own thing. But Joe is a, a great artist, fantastic artist, very cool guy, and a very fun conversation. So let's tune into my talk with Joe Esma. Hello. Hey, Joe, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Awesome. Oh, man, a Ridley Scott fan, I see. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I was like, oh, I had to update my Zoom, of course, because as soon as I turn it on, it's like, oh, got to update. So. Oh, that's quite all right. I know. It's like the days of using Zoom as often as we used to are far and far between, few and far between now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it seems like at one point it was just like, you know, I actually got Zoomed out like after COVID when you're, you know, it's like, well, we got to meet my wife's parents on Thursday and then talk to my parents on Friday and right. my friends on Saturday. And I was one weekend, I was like, look, I can't do Zoom anymore for a while. I just got to, you know, relax. It's just a bunch of people yelling over each other for for, <laughs> for two hours. Yeah. Right. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited. Oh, man. Excited to have you here. So you're in Texas, right? Yep, I'm just outside uh, the Dallas area. So. Oh, nice. Is that where you're from originally? No, I, I, well, I'm I'm from Texas originally, but a little bit further south, uh, a town called West, uh, which is near Waco. Mm -hmm. And uh, I grew up there, went to college over there, and just moved up here. I've been here in this area for like 20 years. So, oh. yeah. Yes, yeah, so w w Waco is, uh, is is one that everyone knows worldwide. Yeah. For not the best yeah. reasons. But Yeah, uh... <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> Cool. So what was life like growing up in Texas? Oh, boy. Like, it's one of those things I, I talk about a lot. Like, I didn't realize how small my world actually was <laughs> until I started kind of going out in the world. Because, like, uh, my my town, which is just north of Waco, had a still has a generally the same kind of population, about 2,500 people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a real small town. And the big city was Waco, which was not that huge at that point and dallas was like it was almost like another nation almost but <laughs> um but yeah it was nice i mean it used to be pretty pleasant uh here like weather-wise but like the summers here are just getting worse and worse and i'm like I'm waiting for my kids to grow and like move and my wife and i can like sell our house and go travel and stuff but um yeah it's That's... it's all right <laughs> oh right on was uh were comics always part of your life growing up uh, you know, they were, which is strange, because uh, uh, they just, I found them around the house. Uh, I don't know if it was my brothers or my sisters that had them, but, um, you know, I was always so visual based. I, I distinctly remember, like, going with my mom to the grocery store, like, at three, before I could really read. And uh, it's just, like, 81 or 82 or something. I mean, it was probably 82 or something like that. Anyway, like... Um, they had the St Marvel Star Wars comics. And I, that was the first comic that I ever got like myself, well, myself, my mom bought it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I remember like being so excited and I was just like, I've never seen anything like this. And I handed it to my sister and she's like reading it. I'm like, what are you doing? Don't read it. Look at the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, no, they, they've always, and then like, you know, my dad was like a, a, a voracious reader and uh, was always, there was a, a, a little bookshop, independent bookshop in Waco that he would go to all the time. And I'd go with them because they had comics and um, yeah. So yeah, long, like pretty much from the get go comics were just like part of my life. It was, uh, was it like, was like, so the, the fact your father was a, a reader, was he, like was he happy that you were exploring reading in your own way through comics or was he like a purist that had to be books or was it was he just no, happy I mean, he was just yeah he was happy that i was reading i mean like he never really took to it he wasn't really into he was more just like like in a prose he read like my dad he was so funny he he was a doctor and like he had uh, a book for everything we literally in my house uh, they took down one of the walls in our living room and just replaced them with like floor to ceiling bookshelves <laughs> and like i thought that was so fancy like me and my friends were little kids were climbing the shelves like we shouldn't have been doing that but um <laughs> but yeah he had all these books for like anything because he would read like you know tom clancy or like he'd have all kinds of books like how to do karate and he had encyclopedias. I mean, like he was just, he loved prose, you know, the written word more. And he, he really wasn't in the comics per se, but he liked nerdy stuff. He just didn't really, I don't know. He just never got the comic stuff. But yeah, he was so, you know, him and my mom both, they, they are always, you know, my mom is still, uh, it's so funny. Like she, she was more the one that was like 
fostering the the comic side mm-hmm. or whatever because she would yeah. take me to the comic shop more often and take me to the the conventions and to this day like you know uh as i as an as a working artist in comics i still don't think really think she understands my job <laughs> <laughs> i don't think a lot of parents do in their own way like i've talked to a yeah. lot of people like yourself who right. you know whose parents are just like generally they're just happy that they know that you're okay like you know like, yeah. oh, he's making a living he's going to be all right and yeah, they, they don't really try to understand it. Like and beyond yeah. that, they're like, eh, it's another world that's outside of ours." But uh, right, well, that's cool. I like that. I like that that sort of note about your father because it, it's sort of like the um, like because I'm kind of I've a I built a library in my house as well. My father helped me mm-hmm. build when we bought this place, and yeah, uh, it, it, and I really love books. Like I love reading. I love I love yeah. the, the physicality of holding them and going through all that stuff. But like you think about like your father, people that like crave knowledge and and want to hold on to it. Like the days before the internet, that was that's what you did. You just had yeah. a ridiculous amount of books or a library card that you used all the time. Like you yeah. you couldn't find any. Like if you want to learn karate, there's your book. Unless there's a karate teacher nearby. Like that's what you yeah. had to do. So uh, the old days of like people learning guitar from books and stuff like that. I'm like, that's insane. Like, how do people do this? And they're just like, put your fingers on these and play. It's like, oh, what? you know, yeah. almost it's everything funny. I know that's useful. I learned from YouTube, like how to tie a tie, right? you know, <laughs> like, you know, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> but I had that when I was a kid, if I had YouTube when I was a kid, it would have just been like revolutionary. And I'm like, oh my God, I can, yeah. I can accomplish so much because I could just look it up on YouTube. <laughs> I remember um, an old roommate of mine who I actually had in the show. He works for Marvel now, David Cutler. He, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, he, uh, he, I remember he wrote some little comic strip when we were, uh, like, when he was in college that was like, I think it was like Turbo Clock or something it was called. It was some kind of little thing about mm-hmm. like a chicken from space. I can't remember what it, the whole thing was, but there's a whole thing about, <laughs> there's a whole thing about like how the, the chicken sort of like amazed that with access to the internet, like every human has, that we're not a race of super. Like, how are we not all super intelligent, incredibly, like, you know, open, uh, yeah. you know, vibrant creatures that know everything right. and are, you know, and it's like, <laughs> and uh, it, it, it poses a good question. It's like, we have all the information we possibly could in the world. How does like racism still exist? How does like yeah. poverty still exist? Like, how does all this thing still go? I guess because people are inherently selfish, but for the most yeah. part, you think with the knowledge we have, like, why aren't we all super geniuses? Right. Yeah, I totally agree with that. That's like a totally <laughs> fair assessment. And I feel like that's sort of like the same sentiment that, you know, Gene Roddenberry had with like mm-hmm. Star Trek. It's like, you know, he wanted to believe in the goodness of mankind that when, in the future, when that series was set, that we would we would have transcended. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, that's a nice <laughs> dream. <laughs> I had a similar talk with, I think, maybe the previous guy that was on the show, Ron Randall. He was talking about that. And I said, like, I, I like the lived in kind of grow, like the Ridley Scott or the Star yeah. Wars version of space, because I feel like that's closer to what it would be. Like right. The grunts just mining, like the movie Outlander you ever, or Outlander. Oh, yeah. See that one? Yeah, the, yeah, I love that movie. Yeah. So like, it's just like, if humans make it far into space, it'd probably be just to mine shit that we could use to make money or, you know, right. the things that we normally do. So the idea of like this, I, I love that Roddenberry was such an idealist and that is his, yeah. his dream was realized in such a wonderful way. And I yeah. hope that that's the future yeah. that awaits us, but um, right. uh, you know, I, I, there's this a real part of me that's seen a lot of horrible in humanity. That's like, I don't know, man. Agreed. 100%. <laughs> it's like it, it was a part of me that's just like i hope but there's a bigger yeah. part that's like uh, right but you know maybe the next generation will figure it out <laughs> hopefully yeah um cool so like as you were discovering comics what were you reading mostly like uh, you mentioned the star wars marvel stuff but yeah i was mostly a marvel guy like it's funny like as a kid you know i mean i loved the superman movies because like the christopher reeve movies were coming out when i was a kid and so i read but like the DC comics were a little bit harder for me to get into just because of all that continuity and uh, something about the Marvel characters were so much more appealing. But like, I remember early on, like my favorite was Fantastic Four because I loved Ben Grimm. I just love the visual of his design, you know, with the rocks and everything. And then um, so he was my favorite. Him and the Hulk were like my two favorites. Um, and I, I laugh about this now, but I remember distinctly there was an uh, issue of Uncanny X Men where it was like I don't remember the number, but it was during the John Romita Jr. Uh, run initially, and it was like Rogue Public en- Enemy, and she was like holding like an unconscious storm, and I was like I don't want to read that one because that looks like a comic about bad people. <laughs> like I thought the X Men were just like mean people because I was reading Secret Wars and they were all like jerks and that you yeah. know. I was, I was like, I don't know. But then like, 
a few years went by and I, I picked up X-Men like right at the end of the fall of the mutants, like the beginning of the Australian song. And that was what hooked me. And then X-Men was just like my jam for uh, the rest of the eighties and the nineties, two thousands. Like that was everything like Nightcrawler is still like probably my favorite comics character. Um, Excalibur is probably my all time favorite comic series. Um, but yeah, like X-Men was really my jam and I, I didn't get into DC till much later, but like, yeah, I was definitely a Marvel kid through and through. Yeah, no, I totally get it. Um, I, uh, me and, um, I, Davin, who I think introduced us for this, um, yeah. he's, he's my co-host on the, uh, the X-Rated podcast we do, which is, uh-huh. we review the X-Men show uh, from the nineties. Oh, cool. And, uh, yeah. We just caught up. Uh, so now we're moving on before the new series comes out, we're moving on just to watch the X-Men movies. In, yeah, in order of their their release, so we watched the Generation X uh, TV movie first. To start, to start I've never seen that. Oh man, you're in for a treat. Um, <laughs> it's it's it, it's something like if you remember that like mid '90s like Buffy, Charm, oh, yeah. those kind of shows and the vibe those shows had. Like, yeah. like what was that show? Um, Jessica Alba was in Dark Angel. A like, Dark those, Angel. Yeah, wow. they, yeah, I know. There's a deep cut. Um, yeah. So, like, thinking about, like, the vibe those shows gave off, this show was so much a product of that time period. Oh and, uh, it's, and, like, Matt Frewer is the bad guy, and he's, like, he's basically doing, like, a Jim Carrey as the mask impersonation. He's so goofy. Like, it's it's ridiculous. It, it has some interesting stuff. And yeah. for for what it was, because it was, like, a made-for-TV movie, it, you know. But it's just, <laughs> to me, it's, a, it's amazing that, like, the first ever live-action X-Men anything was that yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, was, yeah. like a movie didn't get made there was like yeah. you know, nothing yeah of all the things to start with and, and you know i remember being so excited when they had the pride of the x-men that one right. pilot was we did watch that too actually which was cool yeah um, i was like i really wanted that x-men animated series back then i mean i, I love the original animated series yeah. but like i remember when that one came out and then it, they didn't do anything with it and it just like broke my heart but uh, then when the original animated series like came out, like that was appointment viewing. Um, but yeah, it seems weird to start like live action stuff with Generation X, which is a great book. Like, mm-hmm. honestly, like I, I often think about this because like Age of Apocalypse was another kind of fundamental story for me as a fan. Mm-hmm. Um, and also it's like, you know, fired me up to like, you know, want to draw comics too. And that the version of that one, Generation Next is probably like, top tier series of all time like the way it ends is like so shocking Mm -hmm. and like that's the kind of comics like that i want to make is like something that like you know sticks out like that you know yeah that's awesome um yeah yeah, i've been meaning to do i just recently got the marvel unlimited thing so i want to i want to go back and and go through all of the i'm reading uh al ewing's um hulk run now because i haven't read okay cool mortal hulk which is pretty good like I'm, i'm digging it but yeah. um, I want to go back because I have like a lot of the big omnibuses of those big events, but they're such a chore to read. <laughs> like it's like oh, I know. you need like you need like an old time like library tome and like yeah. a medieval thing to read them. Like it's I just... used I used to read comics like before bed, mm-hmm. like you know I would get my trade paperbacks, but then like I, I have all these like I have them. It's out of shot, but I have like all yeah. my normal omnibuses on my shelf here. And I'm like, I can't read this in bed. I can't hold this comfortably and read this in bed. <laughs> you need to sit on a chair and put it on your lap. Yeah. There's another way to read it. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're great. But, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to just because I, I actually been reading a lot more comics just because, like, my wife doesn't like lights on when she's sleeping. So when I come to bed, I can just read it on my tablet. Yeah. And, well, yeah. Pretty handy. Yeah, I put most way. of my stuff over to my Kindle app, too. So, yeah. The uh, me and Davin always chat about like things we want to see come in the next season of that X Men cartoon as mm-hmm. well when that drops. And, uh, we're both sort of I'm really hoping for I'm a big fan of Grant Morrison. I loved his X-Men. Oh, one. Uh, yeah, that. like Davin's not as big a fan as I am, but I, I I adored it. I thought it was fantastic. So I'm hoping for Cassandra Kane. I want to see Zorn. I want to see all of that stuff. Yes, but that's uh, like such a that's such a like a fundamental shift in the franchise. And I remember like being that fan from the 80s and mid 80s and on and like being like, I mean, because I like I love Grant. I love mm-hmm. the Invisibles is probably one of my biggest influences. Oh, yeah. And like, so I, I wasn't like scared of him taking over. Like some some of the people in my comic shop at the time, they were like, I don't know about this. But yeah, like, I, I love really... that people are scared. Like what's going to happen? If it works, it works. if it doesn't, then you'll get your X-Men back eventually anyway. Either yeah, way, they'll so. just reboot it anyway. Yeah, like, exactly. But they'll like, like I remember, and... yeah, it was just so exciting. Was so, what I loved about it was like, it was just so different. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it was, uh, he took the core concept 
and he did something fresh with it something new and it made them exciting again because like for the longest time before that like you were just kind of stale they weren't really I don't know. To me, like they're always going to be Marvel's flagship property more than the Avengers, and I know that's not the way it is now because of movies and everything. But like, man, before the bankruptcy and all that stuff, like it was the X Men. That was Marvel's bread and butter, you know. And like, uh, like so, like the Grant Morrison run to me is like, you know, like it brings it back up to that kind of level of you know relevance. But um, I definitely fell off after Grant's run. Like I, I couldn't. I just, I, mean, I read Joss's uh, Astonishing X-Men, uh, you know, it was pretty good, but nothing, everything else rang hollow. I, I, and I hate to be like that guy, like, Grant set the bar too high. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, kind of. I mean, I haven't yeah. paid attention to a lot of what's going on now with it, with the whole um, Genosha stuff. Krakoa. Yeah, Krakoa yeah. Stuff. that's what it's yeah. Krakoa stuff. Um, yeah. A little bit of it I've read just because I had the Kindle Unlimited thing and a few of those books came up for free. So I just read a few of them and they're, they're good, like serviceable. But yeah. I know it just, it's it's so funny that like, because you know obviously whenever a movie comes out that does well and like the x-men franchise was the first i mean blade i guess technically was the first one that was like let's start throwing some money at more of this stuff and then we got x-men um which i thought x-men one and two i think two is one of the best superhero movies ever made oh my god um but uh like and i love the sam Raimi spider movies but those came later too so Mm -hmm. like the idea that like they're like okay well we got our heroes now in like black leather so we got to match the comics and like that's literally the only thing i think that like is even similar to what the movies were doing to when morrison came on like he's like we're yeah. gonna make it even fucking weirder there's you yeah. know the xavier has a secret twin and like you know zorn yeah. is, and the, the zorn reveal when they did that was like to me like amazingly well yeah. thought out and like phantom x and all these cool new characters and, oh yeah be it like Quentin Choir is such a great addition to the X-Men universe that he created. Like all that stuff. is Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Everything that he did, like he get, he gave them so much mm-hmm. like that they could have just built on. And then they just kind of, I feel like they kind of squandered a lot of what he did. And I know there was a falling out between him and like the editorial at the end of it, mm-hmm. um, which probably, you know, led to some of them, you know, like being like, well, we're just going to discard this or like retcon it and stuff. And that's yeah. like, that's such a shame because like it was, like like i said he kind of reignited the franchise and he left it in a place where like they could have done some really cool stuff with it but mm. you know it's always yeah. like it's funny about that point like when you're a kid and you're reading these comics and you don't really realize about writers about creative teams about shifts and like you're just reading comics so like yeah you know i remember as a kid reading like i think it was straczynski spider-man comics and then like you know not re- understanding the shift between that and like uh oh who's the guy that was doing regular comics at the time uh the regular spider-man series was it Zed Wells or no? I don't know. No, it wasn't him. It was. Uh, it'll come to me a little later, but his, his stuff was just a little more generic and like not mm. nearly, you know. And then, but even beyond that, like when the artist would shift and all that, you didn't really understand. Like I was a big Bagley Spider-Man fan. Oh yeah, in that that period, that golden age of Spider-Man comics, where it was. I'm a big Spider-Man fan, so it was like, yeah. you know, you got Bagley on uh, and Ly- Tom Lyle on Spider-Man, yeah. uh, Basema on uh, Web. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was such a good like uh such a good time and yeah uh, those were those were my favorite spider-man comics is that that 90s era when they had the web and spectacular and uh amazing and uh the adjectiveless one and like yeah because i'm i was a huge sal Buscema fan because like uh, another one of the the, the um uh, comics that i loved in the 80s was rom mm-hmm. and he drew like most of that and like I still love, like, I, I would study, and I still study his art. Like, I go back and, like, grab my trades of whatever I have that he's drawn. And I love the way he draws his, like, expressions. And like, Oh, there's, a, yeah, yeah, incredible. Yeah. And he's so, the like, best I, punch drawer in the business, I think. Oh, yeah. Like, they're always yeah. this massive wind-up. Yeah. Like, you know, and then the guy's oh, yeah. flailing. Like, you just see his yeah. face. Yeah, like, it was always so good. Yeah, uh, it's so over-dramatized, dra- and I just love it. So we're over-exaggerated, and I feel like that is what you need, especially as an artist in comics. Like, you've got uh, you've got a two-dimensional uh, representation of a three-dimensional world, and, like, mm-hmm. the best way to really sell it is to, like, really push, like, gesture and to exaggerate stuff. And, like, guys like uh, Buscema and, and Bagley, too, especially Bagley. Oh, my gosh, Bagley, like, his Spider-Man stuff. Like, he, that's why he'll always be, like, like no pun intended the ultimate spider-man artist is because like i yeah. mean i know we gotta give props to ditko because ditko yes. definitely ditko and romita you know definitely you know touchstones there but to me because i mean i i didn't grow up in that era you know i grew up with the bagley era and 
diagonally to me kind of defines spider-man yeah me and too. just the the fluid nature of the way he moves and everything so i think like one of those life theft comics was like one i had when i was young i think it's the yeah. one where it was revealed that peter's parents were those weird robot things that uh uh, chameleon uh, put in and like and he drew those and i remember like it's probably i I guess no i guess maximum carnage was around when i was a kid because i remember reading that and he was doing books on that Mm -hmm. Um, i just recently reread that uh just because i was like nostalgia i was like oh let's let's see what this is all about man for a comic that came out when it did it's just like reams and reams of pages of like people getting slaughtered on the streets like it's i know know. it's like it's uh, it's stuff and and way too long like it's like 14 issues and it didn't need to be that (laughs) long like like, let's let's just throw in death lock now for some reason (laughs) maybe iron fist will show up and they'll team up who knows why not (laughs) So, like going through school and stuff, I assume you're reading comics and drawing. What uh, would you did you have your own characters, or were you just sort of aping what you were reading? Or <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so I got to high school right around, or I started high school in '92, and that's right when Image started. Mm-hmm. And so I was totally uh, in the tank for Image because, like, I followed you know everything those guys did. Uh, mostly just Jim Lee and Todd McFarlane; those were the guys that I really liked. Is that and a Wilson, Valentino you know. fan. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's funny because I ended up working with Jim. Like, oh, really? He was our original editor on Morning Glories. And, oh, really? Uh, I didn't know Morning that. Glories. Wow. Yeah. So, oh, it was kinda, yeah, it was kind of neat to work with him. And like, you know, he'd actually wanted me to draw Shadowhawk at one point. But I was like, I'm so early in my career. I was like, I don't think I can manage this and this. But yeah, I kind of wished I had. But um, but yeah, so like I was totally an image guy. But like, you know, in terms of my characters, like I literally was like any character I created at that point was blatant ripoff of like Wildcats and X-Men. Like all my characters like were, you know, I, I can't remember what I called them, but like, like you can absolutely hundred percent tell like this is just the X-Men or this is just Wildcats. <laughs> Which Wildcats were just basically the X-Men. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, already, so it's like, so it's like it's the like, copy of the copy of the yeah. copy, you know? So uh, I was like, well, maybe I shouldn't be like uh, coming up with these characters. <laughs> that's that's fantastic yeah but i mean i i you know i they they definitely fired me up but like you know that was the stuff that i liked and i, I really it really resonated with me and um yeah i mean like i had a few characters and i did have one uh and this is kind of a a funny story so like i i, I first got published by image in 2010 for for morning well actually I, I worked on a couple of little fill-in things before that but my first actual series was morning glories number one and um around that same time, like there were a, lo- a couple other artists that came up with me at the same time, Nick Patera, you know, Manhattan projects, uh, Rod Guillory, Chu. Oh, um, I've had him on the show before. before. Rod's great. Oh, I love him. He's so yeah. fantastic. I haven't seen him in ages. I miss him dearly, but, um, uh, but yeah, so like we, we were all, we used to Skype uh, together back on Skype. You know, talk about like weird, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, bygone um, eras. Yeah. Yeah. And so we had this whole idea, like, we we're like, we should do a one shot. And like we should do like because it was I think we were talking about like it was some kind of you know one of images anniversaries or whatever and I don't know if you remember like a few years a couple over ten years ago they were going to do Image United where they were going to have all the image creators like work on it. but I think they did like one or two issues yeah I remember when those came out yeah yeah so we were like let's do we were going to pitch this like we literally like had all our characters we were going to do Image United two. And it was going to be us doing a one shot and it was going to be all the characters that we had created like right around the start of Image. That were inspired by that and so i had this one guy who's basically shadow hawk <laughs> it's kind and, of like uh, alan moore's like 1963 but like you're yeah. with the with the yeah. uh, their version's funny but all of us were too uh like afraid too nervous too anxious to even pitch this to image because we didn't want to like piss them off like the yeah. founders or yeah Eric of course Stevenson. but so we never did it but i think it would have been so funny if we had like managed to do this and publish it but uh yeah so I mean, definitely, and like that's the one character that I had that was kind of decent. I mean, it was still a blatant ripoff of Shadowhawk, but like it was enough that I was like, I could probably manage an eight-page story with this guy. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. So I read a lot. Well, I was did a small amount of research. I don't think to do a lot. It's nicer to kind of come out in conversation. But mm-hmm. um, you hooked up with Nick Spencer through the Bendis message boards because I remember being oh, yeah. on those and like You're talking on, those? To, on talking to other comic people. Yeah, it was like it was great at the time period because it was like. 
uh because i was doing art too and uh yeah. I've, I've only done a few little indie comics i self-published nothing crazy but mm-hmm. um like i remember just talking it, it was it was great to have a community it was like the early days of the internet it was like that board and like uh warren ellis's board like it was like yeah. the two places you go to chat with people about comics or even even get to talk to a creator like i remember who was it the guy that like, so i remember talking about there's like a jla um Elseworld story which was like mm-hmm. set in like um it was like medieval times and i remember like uh the art or the writer was on there and i just was oh, talking nice. to someone about how cool this book was and he's like oh hey I, I i made that and i was like oh my god you know like just to be able to engage and meet the people in that way this is like long before facebook and you know, this yeah i miss it honestly like i really wish that, that that's the thing that i, I miss because like it had its ups and downs and there was a, a period there where it was kind of toxic too mm. but like in in terms of like just how toxic and terrible social media is oh, now, yeah. I wish we could just go back. I could just go hang out with all these people again on the Bendis board because like it was such an important place to me, yeah. uh, just as a fan even because yeah. like because I when I gr- graduated college, like I I had gone to um, uh, college to get a different degree. I didn't you know, and uh, I didn't like the field I was working in, and so like I would be I was literally at work. And I was just browsing the internet, trying to look like I was working and, you know, trying to find some place to talk about comics. That's how I stumbled on the Bendis board. And it was just great for years. I just posted as a fan for years and I was too shy to post my art. Um, But eventually I did and, you know, uh, started networking with people and everything. But yeah, like it was really funny because like I remember when Nick Spencer joined that board he was like this brash young guy who was like trying to break into comics and he was always posting like his story ideas and he was really getting into like heated discussions with people on there. And like, I literally thought he was an ass. Like he was so (laughs) annoying with every one of his posts, but like I I had to give it to him. Like every time he would post his comics, I was like, that's actually really good. (laughs) So um, like he had, you know, managed to get uh, his, one of his books picked up with image and, you know, everybody, you know, everybody was like, there was a mix like everybody was like happy and then jealous or whatever but uh i remember he like because we had this one thread where you could just post your art and he messaged me after seeing my art on there he's like i've got this script would you want to read it and i was i was like okay and like there's only been like maybe two or three times this happened to me in my career where i've like gotten a, a script from a writer and like i literally could not look away until i finished it it was like I mean, it's not a page turner because I'm reading it on the computer, but it was like a, I guess a screen scroller. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I was so engrossed. <laughs> Let's it. make that take off. Screen scroller. This is yeah, this screen scroller. Like yeah. St- Stephen King comment on like the next horror book. Like this is the best screen scroller. <laughs> I couldn't keep swiping on my Kindle. <laughs> yeah, um, I couldn't swipe fast enough. But I couldn't swipe fast enough. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was just so great. It was the first issue. It was like he had like come up with this like just riveting, fully formed story just in this single issue script alone i was like i have to draw this and uh that's how i got started and then yeah nick and i you know uh it was a start of like a really fruitful collaboration and it started with that nerdy message board that i still miss to this day was there uh was that morning glories that script yeah yeah it was morning glories it was was the first issue to morning glories that he'd sent me the script for he'd written the entire thing the whole entire first issue so. And did he have the plot, like the whole thing planned out from the get go? Is it what went? For so that? he says he does. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's like we used to get on, uh, you know, conference calls too, and like he would joke around. He's like, you know, you better hope I don't get hit by a bus because the the, the ending is going with me. If you know, you know, <laughs> I was like, you got it written down somewhere, but. <laughs> um yeah it's so, all up here yeah, yeah. yeah exactly that's what yeah, it is yeah. I'm like, and then like i mean that's the thing about this like we and, and people used to give us so much hell about this like you know we ended up having like uh, there was a site multiversity comics that would do kind of cliff's notes of every issue they would do like sort of like the easter eggs and you know, like how you have like a movie or whatever and there's like yep. youtube videos like easter egg breakdown or whatever there was like one I'm of these guys for those yeah and like this guy like really took to our book and he wanted to do that for every issue and i don't even think we paid him unfortunately but um he did for our site and you know um it, it just blew up like that and, and like you know uh there's just so much intricacy and stuff like that I, I mean i didn't even pick up on some of that stuff and this guy still managed to find it out and he would talk to nick he's like yeah that's what i was doing da, 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 da. and i'm like how do you keep track of this stuff he's like i just got it all up there and i'm like <laughs> I would have to have like, you know, like this huge freaking binder of stuff in order to keep track of like where this character is. And because like 
you know, there's time travel and there's all this other stuff. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. or different time periods, I should say. And like, how do you keep track of it? So I don't know. I mean, like, that's why I think he's such a gifted writer for however, you know, he does have a way with people. He can kind of rub people the wrong way, but I mean, you cannot deny his skill and talent as a writer, you know? There's a, there's a, there's a definite link towards like, uh, like genius and, and social skills sometimes. Right. Sometimes it's because like, sometimes it's because they're so far above the mon- like they're, they're thinking about things that are so far beyond mundane, yeah. mundane things like just, you know, having social interactions, like talking to someone about the weather, you know, or something. Yeah. But, uh, you know, some, and sometimes it's just that they're wired differently. It's not, you mm-hmm. know, Oh yeah, um, you know it's not an excuse, I guess. You don't need to be a dick, but uh, you know, yeah. but but there is levels like you you meet enough creative types, and you're like, yeah, I, I totally understand, you know, a, a level of where all this comes from. Yeah, so, uh, well, that's super cool. So I mean, that that book lasted quite a while, right? It was yeah, it's still technically on hiatus. It's a uh, it went on hiatus at issue fifteen, uh, back in twenty or fifty fifteen. Or, I was going to say, five, there's zero. there's like five eight zero, volumes, sorry. so it's on 15. They don't know how many. Yeah, uh, sorry. It, yeah, was, it was 2016. I was getting them mixed up. I was getting them garbled yep. together. <laughs> it's 2016 when it went on hiatus, and it's still on hiatus. And like, you know, I've stopped asking him, uh, <laughs> you know, what the status is. He's had some life stuff happen, which I'm, you know, I'm not really, it's not my place to say what it was. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's kind of, you know, he's taken a step back from writing comics um i hope he comes back i i would love for him to continue the series but you know my my personal viewpoint is it's like i i don't expect him to so um i i don't know I, i'm just kind of moving on um i would love to come back to it it's still like probably like the one project that is probably like closest to my heart like near oh, of course nearest and uh, i would love to see it finished but you know, uh, if it happens, it happens. If not, then, you know, it's fine, <laughs> I guess. No, I, <laughs> I feel I bad for my long suffering fans who, who still ask me about it. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Your book is like the game of Thrones of the comic world. It's just, yeah. Like, right. You know, I hope he has a little bit more written than the, uh, George. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That guy, that guy seems to enjoy the, it's almost like he, he likes, he's like edging his fans. He's just like, it's coming. Yeah. Uh, I, feel you know. like, I feel like Nick's getting that same lesson too. I feel like he's doing the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Maybe it's a power thing. It's like I know yeah. you want it. I can give it to you when I feel like it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's funny. Um, and I know you probably can't answer this because who knows? But the book and the concept seem so um, rife for adaptation. Mm-hmm. Um, how, like you know, Netflix or streamer of some kind, um, have there been? Um, oh yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so I, we've had lots of uh, close encounters with that, I should say, mm-hmm. and we, we did have it set up at one point with the studio um i don't know how that just dissolved but um at one point i said it's actually funny because i was uh traveling for a show in canada Mm -hmm. and you know i had my phone off and uh i get to the airport for a layover and my one of my buddies texts me he's like hey congratulations on morning glory he's like what (laughs) he's like yeah it's getting adapted i'm like i didn't know about this and he's like yeah i just sent to a podcast this girl says she's writing the pilot episode i'm like what (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so he told me the podcast and so i download it for so on my my next flight i listen to it and she's like talking about how she's been working with nick for like a year and they developed the pilot and you know they're, they're trying to schedule things they've got a series bible and stuff i'm like i didn't hear any of this stuff but like that was always nick's area anyway he was yeah, like i'm gonna yeah. handle all this stuff so he didn't really kind of include me on that which you know whatever you want to say but i was still shocked and so like i literally like wrote him as soon as i got off the plane i was like are you telling me about this? It's like, oh yeah, yeah, we're 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 still working on it. And then that was it. So like I don't know, I don't even know who it was set up with at that point, but like you know, there were there were a couple of different studios involved uh oh, before. See, it um, seems like the kind of thing that studios really love right now or or for the last little while, you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it would be fantastic. The problem, like in, in my personal opinion, I think it would work better is like an animated. I mean, look at Invincible. Invincible uh you know, now it's on its second season. Mm-hmm. really great adaptation of that comic i think yeah. that would be the best bet for morning glory just because there's so many different uh time periods with the same characters and so that was always the next thing because we did talk about this he was like he's like i don't know how you adapt this because you have to have like five actors for one character yeah. and like not all guaranteed to be in like you know every season or every episode so like how yeah. do you set that up you know like for for even for like multiple stuff. sets right like if you have to have like five or six different time period sets for yeah. you know every other thing that's 
it's a lot of cost. Yeah. Um, so um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying it couldn't be done, but like what he explained it to me, I was like, yeah, live action might be kind of weird or like, I don't know how that would work, but I mean, I still, I mean, I would of course love to see it adapted, but you know, that's um, another one. Like, is yeah. it going to happen? I don't know. <laughs> I'm I'm hoping I'm like, I love that Invincible cartoon and I hope that it sets a standard in what's acceptable as Agreed. adaptation because like, it's so good. It's so true to the the book, how fun the book was. And people yeah. are eating it up. It's doing well. Um, all the voice work is fantastic. They picked the best voice actors. Like, yeah. So the idea that like, because, you know, cartoons are always like, see, or animation rather, are always seen as, you know, mm-hmm. a lot more disposable as the, than a regular big live action thing. But when yeah. something like that comes out and does so well, it's like, man, and like now the Scott Pilgrim thing on Netflix. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I just finished like, that. Yeah, I haven't watched it yet. So I've been finishing the Fall of the House of Usher, and I'm I'm on the last episode right oh, now. Oh, nice! Uh, I'm a big uh, Mike Flanagan fan, so I'm really digging that series. But yeah, uh, that's in my queue. I haven't gotten to it yet, but I've heard if you really... like his other stuff, you'll like it. It's it's quite yeah, good. yeah, yeah. Um, he but uh, yeah, Scott Pilgrim is great. And what yeah. I liked about it was like because I, I was like my one of my buddies because like I you know I I love the books, mm-hmm. love the movie, but like to me that that was all kind of done, you know. Yeah. And my buddy texted me. He's like, you've got to watch this. I'm like, but I've already seen it, you know? And he's like, no, 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 no. Just just put your your uh, expectations away and just watch it. And, and you're like, I watched an episode and I was like, okay, whatever. And then I got to the second episode. I was like, okay, I see what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah. And like, yeah, it was really clever. And like, that's the kind of stuff that like excites me is like, like even like if I could even somehow translate that kind of vibe to Morning Glories, if we adapted it, like, you know, it was such a, out of the box thinking like you have the story that you think is already done but then the original creator is involved and they come up with a new way to tell it and i'm like that's cool you know yeah 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 it's kind of interesting it's, it's like everything old is new again like I, mm-hmm. I, I i'm you know like you think about your own life and now i'm like well now i'm reading and now like now i'm going to be watching scott pilgrim again yeah while i'm playing resident evil 4 on, on right? playstation 5 you know yeah. like and uh and watching indiana jones movies and like whatever in the theater yeah. like it's all this stuff it just keeps circling all back yeah. and back and back and back yeah. so it's like i was laughing about that while playing this game it's like you know how many times am i going to replay resident evil games like you know just seems like every 10 years they put in a new one it's like here's two again but better and you're like i'll play this for another time now yeah, so, yeah. Uh, it's pretty great um no that's yeah. cool um, um so i guess morning glories led to everything else right as far yeah. as yeah yeah, that was my that was my springboard. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was a very popular book and and also very interesting one and unique, right? For the uh... Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think I think that's again, you can like try and like psychoanalyze or whatever like how it happened, you know, like there were other books that launched some like around the same time as we did that did not have the traction that we did. Something in the Zeitgeist. And to me that's what's that's what's so fascinating about that book because like we we thought we had something special when we launched it, but we did not have any anticipation for like the way it, it blew up that it did. I mean, we mm-hmm. went to four printings on our first issue. Like we just weren't prepared. And um you know, just for that, that level of uh, excitement, it was just so exciting. And for that to be like my first real big project and to have it, you know, come out like that, that was really exciting. So, um, but yeah, that, that's the one that kind of, you know, and it was, it was, it was reassuring for me too, that I'm like, maybe I'm not wasting my time with this drawing thing. (laughs) Yeah. I think once you get a book that's selling on that level, you can maybe relax a little bit, let, let them know. Yeah. Yeah, the hustle never ends, though. <laughs> that that is true, especially as, as an independent artist, you just always, yeah. always go go go, right? Yeah. Uh, what are you? So, what was the first thing after that, that that you got into? Um, I did some fill-in stuff at Boom. I think I did a book with Sam Humphreys. Uh, it's called Higher Earth. Um, and then I did uh, a run on uh, Boom's version of Big Trouble in Little China. Uh, which was oh i have those okay i definitely oh, yeah yeah, yeah. I, I love because i'm a huge carpenter fan as well yeah, me too me too and uh i mean i'm also i have a man crush on kurt russell so i was like who yeah, doesn't a big, a little China <laughs> i want to draw that so um, it was pretty great like as far as like i, I will never get a sequel to that i mean if we do we better do yeah. it soon but you know yeah. the, uh, where they went with it and the idea of it was like pretty unique i thought it was fun you know yeah and if you know, they were so to funny. have made a sequel it, it serviceable would have been a fun one. right yeah and like I, I went to see him in concert when he played here in dallas oh uh, that'd be and, awesome and uh this one of the the girls who lives here who's who's a uh, uh her name's taffeta darling she does like a lot of the conventions around dallas and she's a cosplayer 
Um, anyway, she had uh, my omnibus or, or one of my trades that has my run of Big Trouble in Little China. And she and I actually drew her in as a cameo in one of the issues. And so she got it autographed by him. And like he was like, like oh, yeah, I know this issue. And like, you know, and he's like, I was like, God, Carpenter, it's my work. <laughs> I mean, he may have just been telling her that, but like, I want to believe that he like liked it enough, you know. I would but hope I, so. He, he, it's funny listening to him in interviews because he always seems like either really fun or like really bitter. And he's it's like so so, somewhere in between, but uh, I like, love he's him. Like, yeah, like I actually like just saw a quote from him or something like he's like, I asked him like why he doesn't do a lot of films now or whatever. He's like, I just want to sit home and play video games. I'm like, that's what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> I still, I still want to see more stuff. I mean, oh, I, I watch everything. I actually, on Halloween this year, I watched his two episodes of uh, Massive Horror because I never horror. saw them. Yeah. So, Cigarette uh, Burns is great. Uh, the, other, yeah, the other one, uh, <laughs> the other one, like, uh, you think I said on my letterbox review, I'm like, you know, this one really feels like a, just a, a payday, you know, like, it, it, it seemed very far removed from the vibe and tone of uh, everything else he has is. Yeah. But yeah. I still, I still to this day think that In the Mouth of Madness or Prince of Darkness are probably like, oh my God. Some like, of that is, underrated good those movies. are some of my favorites. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, the thing my, obviously everybody loves, which oh, I mean, obviously like, yes, but, clearly. I mean, I, I, my brother is my oldest brother is the one who kind of made me a John Carpenter fan, mm-hmm. and he took me to the theater to see In the Mouth of Madness when it came out. Oh, and that's so good! That was like so exciting. Oh my god! Like that was like I was like I'm a fan for life after seeing this movie because I hadn't really seen much of his stuff before that, and uh, yeah, he, he's yeah. so so great. I've but yeah, that was like my first stuff was uh, his I was doing that was the High Earth Run and then Big Trouble in China and then um, I that but then I ended up uh, right around the time Morning Glory's been on hiatus. That's when I kind of made my foray into Archie. So you know, oh, kinda, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, moved from like murdery teens to like you know not murdery teens. <laughs> I don't know. Archie's had a weird like interesting resurgence in the past like decade where they've been like oh let's make it zombies now let's that's make true let's make werewolf archie now let's that's like true. yeah so have... i've drawn it i've drawn every kind of iteration of archie that you can think of and i loved it i'm so happy uh to draw because i've drawn like like my first was like the regular archie series with mark wade mm-hmm. and that was more my style it was more my voice because it's more funny yeah. um it's a little bit more slapstick you know it's a little more you know uh kind of cw show not like not riverdale cw but like kind of you know teen yeah. comedy kind of stuff and then i drew the riverdale comic uh and i didn't like that one as much i didn't because i mean i like I like Archie, but that Riverdale co- doing the comic based on the show that's based on the comic that was a little hard to wrap my brain around. I watched a little bit of the show when it first came out, but to me, it just yeah. felt like like it really felt like they had a script for a teen drama, and they're like, "Let's yeah. just skin this Archie. We'll just make this guy Archie, that guy Jughead," yeah. you know. And and like because yeah. none of them, it didn't really seem like it was like in the first few minutes, he's like having sex with Miss Grundy, and right. I'm like, I don't know what's going on here, but this doesn't like, feel like. Like yeah. it, it, it just felt like Archie and or Riverdale and name only, which is fine. I mean, people liked right. it, it well. I mean, someone yeah. that I know that watched it was like, "Yeah, Betty's father's this vigilante called the Black Hood," and I was like, "Oh, that's cool." They they snuck like yeah. some of the old, uh, like yeah. the, some of the old um, what was the name? Red Circle Comics of those guys. Yeah, were? yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I that remember. was the offshoot of Archie. The, and all that. Yeah, the Web and uh, the Crusader and a bunch of those. Mm-hmm. Guys. Yeah. yeah shield but, that's the other one yeah so i've, I've done that I, i've also drawn the jughead as a werewolf uh jughead the hunger um that's really fun i was really surprised i wasn't sure that i was gonna be a good fit for that but like what was so nice about my time at archie was like you know i got on really well with the editorial team and they like they could throw anything at me and i would draw it because like i was like okay i'll give this a shot and uh Sometimes it worked, you know, really well, like with Archie and with Jughead the Hunger. And sometimes I was like, it wasn't that great. But I mean, I, 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 like in terms of chemistry, uh, like with the Riverdale stuff, but um, I still did like, you know, the best that I could and everything. But uh, the Jughead the Werewolf was like, or Jughead the Hunger is what it's called. Uh, that got me introduced to Frank Thierry, um, who oh, right. like, I, I remember like reading his comics as a fan, mm-hmm. like, you know, before that. And I was like, he's pretty good. But like actually working with him and everything, like he was another one. Like I just like clicked with instantly, like that same kind of chemistry that I'd had with Nick Spencer. Like it got to the point like where he could send the most bare bones script to me, like literally just like maybe the first part of the the page and like have all the panel descriptions with like minimal dialogue. And like, I got this. I know exactly what you want. And uh, yeah, it was uh, it was it was fun. But I mean, I, I loved working all those, on all those properties and, you know, 
Archie was just one of those books that was around my house because my sisters read Archie. Mm -hmm. So it was really nice to, to do something that, you know, I had, you know, had a lot of history with, you know, that uh, that's interesting because there's a real alchemy to comics that, um, you know, that some people really, uh, it's interesting because I, I don't have the experience. I just, just from talking to folks like yourself mm -hmm. about what it looks like when you're working in the big studio system and what it's like mm -hmm. when you have an editor and you have, you know, yeah. whatever. And then you're working with writers. Like some people never meet or really even talk to the writer. They just, yeah. you know, the book sent off to the editor and the editor tells them what the changes are. Mm -hmm. um and like but but when it seems like you have like a close relationship with a particular writer and you guys gel really well then you get mm -hmm. to a level where you can it's sort of like well you know do this like you did that other yeah. thing and you know the language is there so yeah yeah that's awesome that's fantastic. that's the best part for me in comics is like you know when i can click with a writer like that and then we can be so simpatico and uh they don't have to like overwrite or anything like over describe stuff like you know the, there there are people like i'm sure you've you've read these stories about like alan moore's scripts or like you know novels and chris claremont's scripts were like novels and everything and i remember like, reading frank miller's one for i think it was batman the dark knight returns or something yeah it's in the back one of those books and it's like a novel like it doesn't even yeah. really like it doesn't even like have breakdowns or page stuff it's just yeah. like yeah we're totally written out but yeah, i talked like, to ron randall who mm -hmm. uh, was on my last guest and he yeah. worked on a couple of uh, episodes of or issues of alan moore's swamp thing mm -hmm. Uh, yeah and stuff and he was just talking about how uh how descriptive he is in his, yeah. in his like um i made the reference to him about i was i just was just in a um i do i do some theater and acting stuff and i was in a, mm -hmm. a kurt, kurt vonnegut play and you read the script for the play and mm -hmm. it's written like i don't know if you ever read a vonnegut book but the it's like the, the descriptions in the characters is it's like nothing the audience would ever see yeah it's just like just like his reaction and it's so eloquently written in these things right. that, like only for the actors to note uh, yeah it's, it's so interesting and, and it, it just adds waves of extra stuff that's probably helpful as an artist I would mm -hmm. say. yeah so in, in some cases it is it's like it's uh it can be exciting especially like like whenever we whenever i was doing like morning glories like you know nick would give me like links to stuff and like tell me give me some context for what stuff was um other books it's like especially if it's like a really uh short deadline like i'm like just give me everything i just just what i need to draw don't <laughs> you don't have to explain their history or whatever i like i just need the bare bone stuff <laughs> but um yeah so it is a balance uh between the two so um but yeah well i mean i enjoy all those type, types of scripts but yeah it really does come down to uh how well you get along with the writer uh and like you know whether they whether you can believe in each other because there have been projects that I've done where like I've kind of clashed with the writer mm -hmm. and they haven't been as enjoyable. And I feel like I personally don't do my best work in those cases. Um, and then other cases where like the writer and I have such synergy that like, it's almost like I can do it with my eyes closed or something, you know, like that kind of just like trust that you have in your, in your art and in, in the product, you know? Yeah. I, I often think that about like those sort of relationships, like it's kind of like, um, you know, art's interesting because it's like it. If you know what a person's capable of, like say you have a body of work, and I can look at what you've done and see see what the scope of what your work is. Like mm -hmm. it seems like some some creator relationships, they they just trust that the artist is going to do do what they're going to do, and others just really micromanage everything. Yeah. And it's like like it, it's it's so strange because in the art world, it's like. Well, it's, I usually attribute this to like movies when studio gets involved with like a director. When a director has like made all these cool arty movies that everybody loves, so this big studio is like, well, let's bring him in to do a big movie. And then they hang on his shoulder and change everything. Yeah. Yeah. Change everything that makes it unique or what is this? It's like, why would you like if why you, you hire? Him? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, why not exactly. just, why not you just do it or get somebody that's capable of saying action, cut, and that's I just literally... what you wanted to. I literally had the same situation. I'm not going to name the book or the creator, but oh, like a, a, a thing where uh, I was brought onto a book, uh, basically based on my work for Morning Glories and like you know my my style on Morning Glories is a specific kind of style. And then like as I'm working on the book, this writer kept asking me to do it in something like a totally different style than I do. And I'm like, why did you hire me? Because like this, that's not my voice. <laughs> but you yeah. hired me for me to do this, like based on the way I I, I do things in this book, like which. I, I don't do it this way. Like if you wanted somebody to do it that way, you should have hired somebody else. But, you know, it was one of those things where like, we're too far along. We gotta, we gotta go, go, go. <laughs> you know, but yeah. I mean, in the end, like we, we did kind of mend 
our, our, our relationship and everything. And like, you know, uh, I still see this person like around at comic cons and like, you know, it, it's, it's nice. Like I, I don't have any ill will towards him, but I just, it's just that particular situation. I don't know what all, if it was just the situation or, or, or what, it's just whatever X factor it was, it just wasn't gelling, you know? Mm. So. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, what's next for you? What's uh, what's on the go now? Um, well, I just finished a Star Trek mini um, called Halloween. Uh, it's basically the next generation cast uh, gets taken over by this entity uh, uh, that kind of, you know, is really like this evil. Of course, every, every entity is evil, but like it turns <laughs> them into like, you know, sort of universal studio monster uh, versions. That sounds like a and, blast. Yeah, and it, it's it's a really you know fun kind of silly hokey story, and uh, so that one just finished, and I'm I'm uh, in production of a book for Maverick uh, slash Mad Cave right now. Um, I can't really say anything about it because they haven't announced it yet, but it's a, a young adult kind of graphic novel uh, thing, and uh, it's really fun. It's with uh, two writers that I've been trying to work with for like uh, over fourteen years, I think um dave justice and lila sturgis they've done a lot of fables mm -hmm. stuff over at dc and we've had like a couple of near misses we we did an entire issue of something and, and then the publisher it all fell through and so we have a complete issue of something that we can't do anything with um and we did a couple other pitches that didn't nobody got nobody picked up and then this one this one this one thing which i, I can't wait to tell people more about it uh is i think people are gonna really like it. We're, we're hoping it's one of those that is like successful enough that we can do several volumes um, and it's all in our wheelhouse, you know, it's, uh, it's not murdery. <laughs> like I was going to say, do you have a preference as far as like the content of what you're doing or is it just what I really like and what my favorite thing to draw is humor. Um, okay. and I know that's really difficult to pull off in, in comics, but like, this is what this book is like it, it, it there's a, there, it's not a humor book necessarily or a comedy book, but there are lots of comedic moments in it. And uh, that's the stuff I love to do because like, I love exaggeration, you know, uh, I love gesture uh, and like slapstick kind of comedy stuff. And, you know, like what I've, some, something I've done before, like uh, one of my friends got married, I, I spent his entire uh, wedding reception doing caricatures for his wedding party. And like, you know, just that kind of silliness. Uh, I mean, the book's not about, I mean, there's not caricature art in this, mm -hmm. but, um, but just in terms of like exaggeration and mm -hmm. stuff, uh, that's kind of, you know, my wheelhouse. I, I just love humor. That's what, that's my favorite thing to draw and, um, and women, and there are girls in this too. So like, that's like two of my favorite things to draw right there. So, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned fables and I haven't really talked to anybody about this yet. Um, as an, as an, uh, you know, someone that's has a creative mm -hmm. book. Uh, what's your opinion of that whole blow up with uh, with his revelation? Well, I, I would just go. say to Bill, I'd be like, uh, "Good luck with that." Yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean, it feels like yeah. it opens a real crazy legal quagmire on his part yeah. and everyone else's to just release yeah. it to the world. That's a, that's a weird one. Like on on the surface, I'm like, okay, that's actually interesting. I don't know that you can get away with that, but like in terms of like the sentiment i think that's a great sentiment you know mm -hmm. give it back to the fans you know yeah. let the fans do something with it but um whether or not like that's going to hold up in a court of law it's just something else entirely yeah i think everyone's a little tentative to be like putting out their fables books now right you know right. just until exactly. they're maybe sure that like it, it's it is gonna fly it is a yeah. cool idea and, and I, a nice way to stick it to the man Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know um it, it, especially like artists that have been you know screwed out of royalties for yeah. years and years and yeah. and even now with like you know i don't want to speak ill of the the marvel machine but you know you hear stories about like jim starlin who like oh had, sure had a cameo in the movie as a background actor or something yeah. and, and got more money doing that than he did from the yeah. fact that thanos is the main villain for like you know right? you know all that sort of yeah. stuff so yeah apparently they do give you some kind of bonus it's more of more of a shut up bonus than than anything yeah. but it's i, I think, think ed brubaker has talked a lot about that yeah like, well i mean it's for winter soldier <laughs> yeah like you have a movie that's entirely based upon your character uh, essentially your yeah. character what you've created i mean you didn't create bucky but everything that made it the winter soldier you created right so right. it yeah it's such a weird like art and 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 movies like comics and movies are so interesting especially now that like anything and everything is up for grabs like you know mm -hmm. you're seeing all these storylines from comics that are really modern and then yeah. you know really old so and there's there's mountains of it's, it's such a weird time too i find because yeah. 
there's mountains of content from decades ago, mm-hmm. but obviously stuff that's been written in the past couple decades are like the ones that are most relevant to today. So that's what they're mining the most from. So all those yeah. creators are still here and still able to raise a voice about it. And yeah. Then, you know, so there's this weird in between stuff. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. yeah. But cool. Well, that's uh, that'd be really exciting to to uh, to see that new book. That sounds like a blast. Yeah, hopefully it should be. And we were hoping end of twenty twenty four, but it may be early twenty twenty five, just because it's a, a whopper of a book. It's like almost two hundred pages. So it I'm must be nice one. to have a finished book in in a way that you oh, can yeah. like say this is it and yeah, hand it off instead of you yeah. know having the grind of having to meet a, a daily uh, or a weekly whatever uh, deadline right. that you need to not normally. Yeah. Um, did you have a reference for the Universal Monsters? Are you like a horror guy with uh, with the the Star Trek thing, or is that just a yeah? Episode? I I do love horror. Um, uh, I you know it's funny. I was never uh, I didn't get into like the Universal Monsters so much because uh, like I was you know I was more of a Carpenter fan. I liked yep. um, you know uh, uh, Ridley Scott, uh, uh, Kubrick, you know The Shining, all that stuff. That was like my jam. The that other stuff, and I loved Hammer horror um but like the universal stuff was like i felt like it was a little too old for me mm-hmm. <laughs> to be all snobby but i've always liked like the mummy mm-hmm. um so uh you know that one uh i think it was boris karloff was yep. the, the mummy yeah so uh i kind of we had a, a deanna troy in the next gen she kind of becomes the mummy and so uh it was it was fun kind of just looking up reference for all, some of those old movies and just kind of cribbing some of the style and like some of the you know camera angles and stuff who's yeah. the uh who's the gill man the creature from the black lagoon oh it's wharf oh. <laughs> um, uh, yeah and that's the funny thing too it's like you know universal so litigious like I, was, I did a panel in new york comic-con and we talked about this i was like um so these i'm sure you've heard of the studio that you know this these characters are all kind of based on but like we can't really say their names because we don't want to get sued mm-hmm. <laughs> so because it's funny because like I did a design for Worf uh, as the creature of the Black Lagoon and they're like uh, like Paramount sent it back and like you're gonna have to you know re- revise this because it looks too similar to the you know uh, like the the actual creature of the Black Lagoon and we don't want to get sued. <laughs> so I was re- listening to a, I listened to a podcast with um, uh, the best movies never made. It's called with, yeah, uh, I love yeah. that show. Oh, me too. Yeah, I'm a huge fan. Yeah. I'm a bit, I'm a huge Joe Dante fan. Oh, oh, sorry. No, sorry. I'm getting that mixed up. So uh, there's the movies that made me, which is the, oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the Joe Dante and uh, Joe Josh Dante, Olsen yeah, one. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah. the best movie, I was actually just listening to the best movies never made today, which is why. I, oh, okay. But yeah. uh, I'm talking about, uh, coincidentally, to circle back to when we were talking about, they did the episode on the sequel to The Thing. Did you oh, yeah. That one? Which is, I did listen to that. That one was heartbreaking. I was like, why I did know. they make this? It sounds like it would have been so good. Ah, I know. Um, but when they were talking about, I think it was on the the, the movies that made me. Uh, Dante was mm-hmm. talking about the Monster Squad, I think, and how yeah and they were, or maybe it was when Decker Fred Decker was on it or something, and he uh-huh. was talking about how like originally you at that point Universal like didn't even care like those characters were so yeah. long gone they're like you go ahead and just they're like we want to make this movie where we use these characters and I think they made them change it last minute like somebody noticed that they were going to be doing something that was too similar so they had to rechange the designs of a bunch of the characters to make oh, them different God. like that's why the Gill Man looks you know significantly yeah. different although I think the Gill Man and Monster Squad is probably the best looking one. Oh, I agree uh, that yeah. one or the one from you know the Shape of Water but that one is pretty close yeah. to the original anyway yeah. oh, I love the Monster Squad that now see that's a, a property that I think that if they if somebody ever gets the rights to do that like i want to draw that comic <laughs> like you know because like i mean obviously that movie is like you know it has a complete story but i'm like man if you want to because they anybody can franchise anything at this point yeah <laughs> like let's make like a whole uh monster squad comic franchise <laughs> yeah the idea of those kids growing up and like you know yeah. i mean trying to do like the i there are these um documentaries that came out called in search of darkness um, yeah i remember yeah. those yeah, I I I, I kickstarted all of them with my big fan, like horror fan. Oh, so, nice. Um, you know, they're like the kid that played the main kid in that is in all of them. Like he just seems like yeah. to love horror movies and just want to chat about. Yeah, he it. goes and does like screenings. I've seen I've seen these things. Like, he'll go to Monster Scott screenings and he'll like do Q and A panels afterwards and stuff. And I'm like, he seems like the coolest guy. So, yeah, I yeah. love when people that are like involved in in. Uh, those sort of things are like love the products they're in. There's so few actors that seem to come out of like being a child actor in something mm, and have horrible mm. stories or, you know, memories yeah. about what it was like. But when someone has real love for it and that shines through, even when they're an older person, it's, it's really cool. Yeah. 
You don't yeah. see it a lot. And it's funny because I never really liked the Goonies. I never watched it as a kid. I only watched it as a bitter adult. And as an adult, I'm like, this is not a good movie. That's a shame. Uh, but Monster, <laughs> yeah. So like everyone yeah. that loves it has that nostalgia. And I didn't. Yeah. Didn't. But like, I never watched The Princess Bride as a kid either. And I watched it as oh, a kid. And I love man. that movie though. I love that movie. It's great. Yeah. So, yeah. That one yeah. really shines through that an adult. Inconceivable. Can no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh yeah but the monsters club is another one where someone's like i have great memories of this as a kid and mm -hmm. i'm always like wary like i usually ask people what their favorite movie is and if i haven't seen it i'll go watch it so that's yeah. how that's what led me to the goonies and also led me to princess bride now the prince oh, okay nice. not so much and i've seen some good ones that way but a lot of the ones people say are like nostalgia ones from when they were kids yeah. um and like like a, a a girl i know said drop dead friend was her favorite movie and i went and watched it and, oh it's a bad movie it's a, it is it's a great it's concept good. but a bad movie um <laughs> like i'm like if someone took that concept and like did that again you know with with the idea of like your visit your imaginary they kind of yeah. did it in other things but like that grant morrison comic happy sort of played oh yeah 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 bit. Uh, and the, that was a great adaptation too. Those two seasons of that show were fantastic. Yeah. But um, yeah, that idea of like your 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 imaginary friend from your youth coming back as an adult and like coaching you through all your adult problems is like an interesting idea. It just yeah. was a terrible execution. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's just not the right time, you know. <laughs> That's fair, yeah. Yeah, but uh, oh, cool. Well, um, I won't want to keep you any longer than I than I need to. I just want to uh, thank you very much for being on the show, uh, Joe. Oh, this has been fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. I have such a good time. If I find my way in Texas, I'll look you up. Okay, great. That'd be awesome. And if you're ever in, <laughs> if you're ever in Nova Scotia, Canada, drop me a line. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they have they do have comic cons here, but not like there's there's one good one in uh, Moncton. Uh, the uh -huh. East Coast Comic Expo, which is a pretty great one. Oh, okay. And then there's something called Howcon and Halifax, but it's uh, it's usually more science fiction-y based and less comic booky. But the, the East Coast Comic Expo is a great one. So. Oh, good. Maybe yeah. someday yeah, we'll see you out there. I love going up to Canada, so I would love to uh, come do more shows up there. So uh, yeah, yeah, Nick uh, Nick Bradshaw works for Marvel is uh, involved a lot with the uh, the East Coast one in in Moncton. Oh, so. cool. So nice. yeah, it's it's a cool it's a cool event. They've had a lot of cool comic people out over the years, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, yeah, maybe someday we'll see you there. Yeah, it'd be great. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joe. Great talking to you. Yeah, thank you, Andre. Appreciate right. it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. There you have it, my conversation with Joe Esma. Big thanks to him for being on the show, and big thanks to you, gentle listener, for tuning in once again. Hopefully you're ready for the holidays, as it were. So as this episode is dropping on December 11th, I believe, the next episode should drop on Christmas Day. So hopefully I have that uh, well recorded in advance, and uh, it will drop on the the, the the loveliest of holidays itself and you can tune in whenever you get a chance you know don't don't you don't have to forego opening your christmas presents or or whatever holiday you're you're celebrating to to go listen to the episode it'd be nice but you don't have to you can put it you have my permission to put it off for a day or two until you uh, you get through the holidays with your friends and family and loved ones and all that good stuff but uh if so, um, and you are listening to it on that day, well, maybe we'll do something special for the holiday. So let's find out. The who knows? Only time will tell. But uh, big thanks again for tuning in. And I guess I should tell you who my next guest is. I'm kind of a little hesitant to say it because I'm not sure how to pronounce his name correctly. Um, he's Australian, and he is a comic book creator as well. His name is Christopher Sekira. Uh, S-E-Q-U-E-I-R-A He's done some amazing work in comics and uh, and I'm very excited to have him on the show. He's another one that um, Davin helped me secure. Thank you, Davin. I know you're listening as you are a, a normal listener of the show. So yeah, he'll be on next week's episode and uh, coordinating with him was interesting since he's in Australia and there's like a 14 hour time difference. But I think we got it figured out, and I think the episode should be dropping soon. And if I pronounce his name incorrectly, well, I'll find out and then be able to, to course correct, hopefully, when we get there. So uh, Sakira is a writer and artist um, who's worked on some comics from Marvel. He's in Dazzler. He uh, worked on uh, X-Men vs. Vampires and a bunch of other things as well. Very cool comic book creator artist, and, uh, and I'm very excited to talk to him. So it's going to be a great episode. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So thanks for tuning in. I will catch you on Christmas Day. 
The Graphic Histories Podcast is a proud partner of the United Federation of Podcasts.